Good morning and a warm welcome to the 15th meeting of the Constitution Europe External Affairs and Culture Committee in 2024. This morning we've received apologies from Mark Ruskell, MSP, Megan Gallagher, MSP and Keith Brown, MSP. And we're also joined on committee by uh, committee substitute Kevin Stewart. Our first agenda item is to continue to take evidence on the committee's inquiry on the review of the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement. We have two panels this morning and we are firstly joined from the UK Domestic Advisory Group, or DAG as we usually call it, uh, and a very warm welcome to Sean Maguire, the Chair, and Irene Old Oldfather, Vice Chair. So, um, uh, and I welcome back to Miss Oldfather. I know you've engaged with us on these issues um, previously uh, in this session of the Parliament. And uh, your role in the Scottish Advisory Forum in Europe. So, um, I'd like to open with just um, a note that you've recently published the priorities report and highlight emerging and ongoing issues in relation to the TCA. Uh, the focus of our inquiry has largely been on trade of goods, but we're interested in other aspects as well. And um, I, we know the key issues identified by the DAG members in relation to trade and goods, as well as how the TCA could operate better to facilitate trade. So we'd be interested in your thoughts on the priorities. And if we could maybe begin with Mr. Maguire. Thank you. Good morning and, and thank you very much for the opportunity to, to be here today and to address uh, the committee. Um, as you said, I'm, I'm chair of the domestic advisory group, but I'm also director for Europe and International for the CBI. And I just want to note that given that we are in a regulated period, I will be speaking on behalf of the DAG and not as the CBI in this period and will be keeping comments fairly, fairly general, um, but willing to pick up afterwards uh, once we're out of the regulated period on any further, further detail. Um, as you, as you said, we uh, are, have the DAG, which comprises of business organisations, civil society, academia and trade unions. Uh, and we have recently published uh, a report highlighting both short term and long term uh, measures that we would see that could improve UK EU relations, but also the uh, implementation and functioning of the TCA and indeed it, with an eye to review in 2026. The five areas we focused on were trade and customs, um, regulatory cooperation and level playing fields, um, business and labour mobility, um, energy uh, and climate change, uh, and the work that Irene, uh, the Vice Chair, had led on nations and regions. Uh, and I think what is important uh, to kind of outline in this is that there are two elements uh, to, to kind of the report. One is very much focusing on practical and technical solutions that can be done without any kind of political involvement, without any review of the TCA. Uh, and perhaps we have seen that while the um, atmospherics uh, and indeed the relations between the UK and the EU has improved since the conclusion of the Windsor framework. Perhaps we haven't seen that merge within the kind of plumbing of, of, the, of the TCA uh, and the various specialised trade committees uh, that have been set up. Uh, and one of the um, key aspects of the report is how we engage better uh, with the civil society, with business organisations, with trade unions, to help those specialised committees function more effectively, where we can identify what the problems and challenges are and where um, solutions might lie. Um, it is worth noting that you know this TCA is a, a zero, or almost zero tariff, zero quota um, TCA or trade agreement, uh, and the challenges that, that certainly individuals, businesses have felt probably come in with the trade, um, the kind of non-tariff barriers and technical barriers to trade, which we can elaborate on going forward. I would just like to say, uh, before we go into more detail and just the opening remarks, that while the DAG report is an expression of the DAG as a whole, it shouldn't be seen as a reflection of the political position of every individual organisation within the DAG because some of these come at it from different perspectives. So uh, again, some will uh, 
focus much more on, on sectoral issues, some will be much more on the mobility issues, some will be much more focused on the energy and climate issues. But as a whole, we stand behind the report as a, as a kind of snapshot of some of the challenges that we see in the UK-EU relationship and where solutions can be found. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms Oldfather, would you like to come in too? Thanks. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Good morning, convener, and thank you very much for, for inviting me back. It's uh, lovely to be here today. And I mean, Sean really is our trade expert. I suppose what I do is bring a little bit of the citizen's voice um, to the agenda. And, and probably just to take, say two things by way of introduction. I mean, for me, there are very close links between trade and citizens, and we don't always see that. You know, we think about it as a business and uh, think that actually um, a, a report on nations and regions reach right into our communities in Northern Ireland, uh, Wales, England, and Scotland um, through very much a partnership approach. And, you know, I'm quite proud that the DAG undertook that work because um, it gave citizens an opportunity to have a say. And, you know, if not us in this, then, you know, where was that coming from? So um, I think it was really important that we did that piece of partnership work. And it's very clear to me that for citizens' trade, it is about um, the availability and cost of food in our supermarkets, about medicines in our high streets, it's about the safety of our goods and our retail shops and, and you know, also something about and maybe we'll be able to say a few words about it later in the agenda around equalities and, um, you know, barriers for citizens and, and disabled people um, and trade and trade agreements can make such a big difference in these areas. And in fact, um, you may be aware of the work, Kintina, and if not, I know Spice will be right on to it. You've got such an excellent uh, team there. But um, Public Health Wales have been doing quite a lot of work around making trade agreements work for citizens. Um, and I think it's been quite... Uh, innovative the way in which they've looked at wider trade agreements. So um, for me, that connection between trade and citizens is really important. Um, and we have certainly in the UK DAG made sure to take account of that. Thanks, convener. Thank you very much um, uh, for those opening remarks and for the report, which we, we all have in our, uh, our papers. Um, I wonder if I could just ask, uh, and it's relation to, you know, obviously, um, we, you're here with our, our European hats on for the committee this morning, but also we, we have culture within our remit. And um, I note from your report that you, you were talking about um, the, the, the movement of um, workers, particularly in the culture sector and in those areas, and, and also whether you had, and I appreciate um, the, the, the time that this is, is um, was, was mentioned by Mr Maguire in terms of, of, the, of the election being on, but also about the, um, the offer of the EU for the youth mobility exchange and um, what uh, did the DAG have a position on, on, on what what the, the position is on that, given that the, the, the two main parties have, have, have said no to that at the moment. And do you think there will be opportunities with a new government in the UK and also a new government forming in Europe post the elections for some of these issues to be revisited? I, I maybe come to Miss Oldfather first on that one. Yes, I mean, you know, clearly um, as a UK domestic advisory group reaching out to civil society and a huge part of that young people, it's incumbent upon us to hear the views that young people express and to take them forward. Um, and, you know, it has been very clear that young people across the UK, there was a session held in London last October and I chaired one of the plenaries and two other of the subgroups um, and clearly it is in our DAG report reflecting that view of young people that they are very keen to improve and increase opportunities around youth mobility. Um, I don't know if, if Sean wants to add anything to that but um, I, I, I think you know we're not politicians, um, we're, we're representing the various sectors that the DAG um, uh, represents in terms of our social partners and you know it is very clear that young people want to see these opportunities um, that uh, are available. Thank you. Um, Sean I don't know if you want to come in. 
on that point at the moment? Yeah, yeah I think uh, I think it's important to to stress that youth mobility can be an important factor of many trade agreements. In fact, with Canada, uh, we also have uh, opportunities for for youth mobility. So it shouldn't just be seen within the context of a UK EU uh, perspective. But but youth mobility is important, and youth mobility isn't just about uh, school children, school exchanges. It is much wider and certainly an important uh, sector uh, for the UK. Both, I would say, it's a business sector, but it's also much wider than that. As are universities, and certainly attracting foreign and international students is an important aspect for our university sectors in the in the, in the UK. So anything that can help improve uh, that um, is certainly welcome uh, within the widest context. As I said, not just within the EU uh, um, context, but also it is important within the kind of business community, where you know the opportunity for. Um, in graduate schemes within companies to work in other parts of, of a business outside the UK is something that we would really want to advocate, particularly in line with the skills agenda, which is important that we can attract uh, the best talent from around the world um, to, to, to the roads, uh, both in the UK, but also give individuals and youth the opportunity to learn from others in other parts of the world. So, so we, we will see what will happen post post the UK elections and indeed the elections in the UK. But actually, youth mobility is something that should be cut across all trade agreements going, going forward, not just uh, solely to, to the EU. Uh, maybe I could just add, you know, that we did hold an All Nations Summit last November and, and Sean was there. And we had a particular breakout group um, with young people, very, very strong representation across all five nations. Um, and it was very clear there that um, they, they were keen to take that widest possible engagement forward. And in discussions with the business community in Scotland, I have to say, um, it's very clear they are very supportive of um, you know, these kind of schemes that give young people experience and certainly language training as well, which has fallen quite a bit since Brexit. Um, I, I know the business community in Scotland very supportive of sort of apprenticeship and business exchanges in relation to to young people. And as Sean says, you know there are already agreements with it. I think it's Australia, New Zealand, and others. Um, but I, I personally did think the European Commission's proposal was a very ambitious one, which I thought um, was was very helpful. Um, and and you know let's let's hope that going forward we're able to work together to find some common views on this. Thank you. I'm going to bring in Mr. Kevin Stewart first of all. Um, thank you, convener, and I just I'd like to follow up and. Uh, Mr. Maguire's uh, point uh, about universities, uh, because repre representing the great city of Aberdeen, we have the University of Aberdeen and Robert Gordon's uh, University, uh, both very important institutions uh, that in the case of uh, the University of Aberdeen has attracted students from overseas for centuries. Uh, and in the case of RGU, um, for many decades, uh, and uh, you know, I think the youth mobility um, proposals by the EU, rejected by Labour and the Tories, um, is a missed opportunity. And what we are seeing is our institutions, um, our university institutions, being held back, stymied, um, and in some cases put in, in positions of crisis. Uh, because of an inability um, for overseas students uh, to get the relevant visas, etc. Um, Ms. Oldfather talked about the trade agreements with Australia and others, uh, but you know, in terms of uh, past um, scenarios where there was an attraction uh, of, of folk not only from the European Union but um, particularly from certain places in Africa and Asia, that seems to have gone. What are the DAG doing in terms of looking at that? What engagement have you had with the universities? And while I've talked about the ones in Aberdeen, I know it's the same for universities um, throughout Scotland uh, and uh, throughout these islands, um, in terms of the difficulty 
uh, and the inability um, to, to get students in. I'm happy to uh, pick that up. Please, uh, Good to see you. Mr. Sue. Hi, hi, Kevin Warren. Um, yeah, so so just to let you know that on the Scottish Advisory Forum in Europe, which feeds into the DAI and has been very much um, consulted on the nations and regions subgroup, we have um, a whole range of universities, and you're right, universities like St, An uh, St. Andrews, Aberdeen, uh, Edinburgh, and others are very affected by this. Um, uh, and so they've had an opportunity to input, and you know they clearly do support um, that position. And, and the DAG in its report um, alludes to, and, and mentions um, the importance of youth mobility and the role of universities. So um, it, you know we're certainly reaching out into these academic communities, and we're very much we're very much hearing what they say. Um, and at our last uh, DAG meeting in Edinburgh, actually. Uh, we heard from uh, Nick Thomas Simmons, and we did actually put almost the very question that you've put to me to him, um, recognising the merit and the value in the European Commission uh, paper. And so I think you can be assured, Mr Stewart, that the DAG are very actively pursuing these matters. Um, it takes it takes governments uh, to make the decisions, but we, we're very actively pursuing these matters, having heard very strongly um, the voice of academia across the UK. Um, thank you for that. And, uh, you know, you're right to point out that it's the governments that make decisions. Unfortunately, in terms of all of this at the moment, in my opinion, the UK government is making all of the wrong decisions. Do you really think that you have got an influence to be able to change minds uh, on these extremely important issues, which are affecting people um, and uh, institutions and stymieing economic growth. Because at the end of the day, if we are not uh, attracting the best students here, um, that means that we don't have the opportunity for them to, to, to um, join our workforce. Um, and you know, many of uh, uh, the folk in the past who've come to study here have been some of the greatest minds and the greatest entrepreneurs that uh, that we've had. Like, like you, Mr. Stewart, I'm very proud of our our Scottish education system. Um, and and you know, are are we doing enough? I suppose is your question. Um, actually, we're working very closely with European partners. Um, the European Economic and Social Committee has recently produced an opinion. It was agreed by the whole uh, committee at the end of April. And um, Scot Scotland was very much involved in that. Um, the opinion was by Killian Lohan. And in taking soundings around this, he had actually attended our All Nations conference that I referred to that took place in Edinburgh last November and consulted with the young people at that conference. So we're working very closely with our European partners. Um, we have regular meetings with uh, with uh, the UK, the EU delegation to the UK. Um, and we had uh, Pedro Serrano, as you know, in Scotland uh, in, in April as well and raised these matters with him. So, um, I mean, Sean may want to say a few words about how we're uh, consulting on a wider basis on the report. And um, obviously, because we are in Perda, we're not going to get meetings with ministers at this point in time. But certainly we look forward um, in the months after the election uh, to be raising these matters directly, which are in our report, which we're very supportive of, to be raising directly with ministers. But I don't know if you want to add something on the communications and engagement around that, Sean. Oh, well, well, thank you, Irene, and, and, and thank you, Mr Stewart. Um, I think, starting off, um, this report is, is a snapshot in time. It doesn't deal with all issues, and it doesn't go into every detail uh, under every aspect of the report. If that was the case, it would be much longer than, than the, the 20 odd pages that it is. But it shows where business, trade unions, civil society and academia have come together to highlight where there are challenges and indeed where there are opportunities. <clears throat> it is also worth bearing in mind the UK is just one party to this agreement. 
there is the European Union as well. And you did allude to, to the mobility, youth mobility uh, communication from, from the Commission um, a few months ago. Um, certainly from the EU DAG, which is our counterpart, mobility and youth mobility is a high priority for them as well. And if and when uh, the politics um, calm down uh, post elections in the UK and indeed uh, the elections in the new commission in the EU. There is an opportunity for us as the UK and the EU DAGs to work together on key issues and certainly youth mobility is there. I would also just highlight that you know we have to be realistic about uh, uh, how quickly we can move forward in a number of these areas. It has been an incredibly difficult period since 2016 and the negotiations and relations are certainly much better than they had been a number of years ago. Um, but we need to sell uh, why moving forward in some of these areas around youth mobility is not just in the interest of the UK, but in the interest of the Euro Europe and the European Union as a whole. And certainly on the area of, of universities, I think our EU counterparts look with envy at the quality of our universities. And indeed, as a quite startling statistic, after the UK left the EU, there isn't a top 10 university in the EU. So I think there is very much a element of jealousy or certainly uh, a need to work with universities because of the quality of the universities in the UK. There is a win-win situation and I think we should look and focus on where there is win-win for both sides that we can move forward, not just purely for the kind of optics, but actually how this can bring real economic value and indeed address some of the this, this societal challenges that both the UK and the EU face when it comes to, to climate change, when it comes to AI, when it comes to, to the skills agenda. And, and I th certainly think uh, going forward, we can work with the EU as in a joint campaign around the mobility issue and particularly youth mobility in universities. Thank you. Um, you're a bit optimistic in terms of hoping that politics calms down in the UK. I think we may see uh, some chaos for some years to come because of the decision uh, to leave uh, the European Union. Um, in terms of your engagement um, uh, with academia, um, with the universities around about these issues, are they highlighting to you the major difficulties that they face because um, they are unable to, uh, uh, well, not unable to attract, but unable uh, to, to get folk uh, the necessary paperwork uh, to, to study in, in Scotland. What, what are they saying to you uh, around about um, their financial positions? Because in some cases, universities uh, will have lost, uh, well, uh, have lost a huge amount of income because of this um, and you know some have suggested that if there are no changes then you know they may be in precarious positions in the future which they wouldn't be um, if we still had that free movement no i mean uh I just, I mean, I, I can be very brief. I mean, I know we'll speak on behalf of universities and individual universities and, and their financing, but the, you know, the headline story is as a result of uh, the removal of free movement and indeed uh, lack of uh, cooperation or mobility of youth, the uh, attractiveness uh, of UK universities for international students has diminished, which has had a direct impact on the financing of, of many of our universities who saw this and, and as a major source of income. So certainly uh, we would call on any government going forward to look at this seriously in the wider context of uh, universities as an important sector in the UK, not just in terms of, of academia and education, but as a, an investment and an export potential going forward. Maybe, maybe I could just... Oh, yeah, sure. please, Hi, Irene. Thanks. Sorry. I was just, was just going to say, I mean, you know, Kevin, the question you asked was, what are they talking to us about? And I can honestly say the two most important things that are raised by the universities are Erasmus Plus um, and Horizon. 
and um, we lobbied very hard on Horizon alongside the universities. We're very pleased that that door's been opened. We hope that it opens the way to other possibilities, um, but the universities are very uh, pleased about that. And in fact, um, you know, there's various summits coming up in the next few weeks around how we can not just uh, be part of Horizon, but how in uh, the UK and in Scotland we can actually lead on Horizon projects. And uh, the chief scientist, Anna Dominicek, um, is very active in that area because she's led Horizon projects in the past. So Horizon's a really big talking point with the universities. And the second one is, as you would expect, um, Erasmus Plus. And again, that links into the youth mobility. Um, you know, you'll be aware and, and we refer to it in our uh, Nations and Regions report about the work in Wales around Tithe um, uh, and, and, you know, how that could be a model. But actually, even with uh, Wales, there is agreement that it would be really good if we could have some kind of very active uh, Erasmus Plus uh, programme back in place again. So, so for me, those are the two big issues. Thank you. I'm glad you've managed to help open one door, but there's many more doors to open. Uh, thank you, Convener. <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I'm going to move to Mr. Bibi. Thank you, um, Convener, and good morning. Um, we talked a lot about youth mobility there. Um, as the Convener mentioned at, at the outset, the DAG's recent report highlights the priority around the importance of mobility for artists and technical support staff by way of a cultural worker visa. Um, now, obviously, that will affect a lot of young people, but um, but, but people of all ages, really. Um, so I just want, I wanted to kind of ask how that recommendation has been received and how likely you think that is going to progress. How, how well has it been received? I, th I, I mean, uh, I, I will be very honest. Um, we sent this to the European Commission. Um, and indeed many of our European stakeholders. They have been very tight-lipped in any of their responses. Um, you know, they do not have a mandate to go much further than the current uh, provisions set out in the TCA. And I think this is perhaps one of, I think, the frustrations that many of the DAG members have expressed to write this. It, as I said, the kind of Big politics relationship seems to be better, but the functioning of the various specialist committees, working groups have probably been underperforming. Uh, and it is certainly something that has been uh, highlighted in many of the discussions with the DAG, um, where these issues have been raised, whether it's by the UK side, uh, they have a nice conversation and they leave and they don't meet again for another six months. And I think one of the big recommendations uh, in the report, and indeed something that we've been advocating for, is that there must be much more cooperation between the UK and the EU on many of these issues to find practical, technical solutions. On the kind of cultural waiver, um, it is noted by the EU side, but of course they don't have a mandate to go much further. Um, and that, that is perhaps the frustration that many of our, our UK uh, colleagues have had. And it shouldn't just be limited to a cultural waiver. In fact, we would like to see it extended even much wider to those that, I mean, we, you're talking about trade and goods. One of the great opportunities and one of the great uh, assets of the UK is our services sector. Uh, and in order to, to kind of boost the service sector and indeed universities as part of that, a, b a big part of that is uh, of kind of providing services is linked to mobility. And so we would like to see a much more ambitious uh, agreement on that kind of uh, mobility issue relating to the provision of services, but also the cultural waiver. You, you know, you, you will note that the UK has gone for six months. The EU has done 90 out of 180 days. We would like the EU to kind of push towards the six months and have a, a much more open door policy to this one. So I think there is something in the EU to, to do to help us uh, address some of these challenges. But as I said, uh, the kind of high level political politics better, atmosphere is better, but in terms of getting 
things through in the various specialised committees, working groups, and indeed some of the working groups have not met. That is where we find that the, the, the full potential of the TCA has not been fulfilled. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> thank, th thank you for that answer. Yeah. Um, clearly, when you're negotiating such a complex agreement as the TCA, um, you know, people are going to want to look at it in the detail of specific issues, but also in the round. And actually, if there's if negotiations can, it, I imagine it's particularly challenging to have, um, you know, um, you know, to, to to look at the details whilst also looking at things in the round as well. Um, I just wanted to ask a question just about the um, the just a follow up from our last discussion with the DAG on the um, uh, the Law Society of Scotland. Um, now, I understand the DAG has representation from England and Wales via the Law Society and Bar Council, um, but the Law Society of Scotland are not a specific member of the DAG. Um, I know that was something I think, uh, Irene, you were hopefully, possibly um, hoping would be addressed. I just wanted to see if there was an update on that, um, because clearly if there's legal ramifications um, for the devolved nations, and particularly here in Scotland, um, you know, we, we, I think it would, you know, it'd be advantageous to have have that input from the Law Society of Scotland. I mean, a really important point, Neil, and um, I, I, and also just to say on the point that you made before about the, you know, the cultural situations. Uh, it's certainly the DAG's position is that we support that that visa waiver, um, and we recognise how important it is for musicians and other artists to have an extension beyond the 90 days. So, you know, it is our policy to support that. But in, in relation to the Law Society of Scotland, um, I mean, Sean, myself and uh, Steve Turner had uh, some discussions with the Secretariat around um, the situation in relation to the Law Society of Scotland. Um, you will know that at present uh, membership has been reopened. It's not in the DAG's gift to decide membership, um, but membership has been reopened. And um, I've had some communications with the Law Society of Scotland and encourage them to apply. It's been a huge disappointment. It is something that we raised really from the get go. I'll be honest, um, as an executive council, we were very supportive of a place for the Law Society of Scotland. Um, the UK DAG is sitting at something like 70, uh, 60, 60 odd members, I think, Sean. Um, and, you know, the arguments that were always put back to us was that the UK DAG is very big just now. But that inequity that you point out um, is something that the Executive Council um, have consistently raised. And I would fully expect to be addressed in the opening up um, of, of the membership at present. It's open until I think it's the 19th of June. Don't know if there's anything you want to add, Sean. Uh, no, I, I, I don't I think it was open until the 19th of June, but given that we're in a kind of PERDA, um, you know, this requ membership requires ministerial decisions. Uh, and those will probably be delayed until post the election. And of course, um, the kind of operation of government takes some time to to bed down after an election, but we will we will keep the pressure on to ensure, uh, as Irene said, that there is geographical representation on, on the DAG uh, because we think that that is incredibly important uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. <coughs> Thank, you, Mr. Stewart. <laughs> Thank you, convener. Thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. Mr. McGow, you talked about the report being a snapshot. Of, of where we are and, and how things have at present uh, the situation is. And, you know, when it comes to the participation and engagement uh, that we've seen, and especially on areas like citizens' rights and equality, uh, the, the Nations and Regions subgroup had spoken about uh, ensuring that the, the relationships between the EU and UK uh, when it came to equalities did not fall uh, within the remit of the TCA. So can I ask about how things are being monitored uh, at Progress when it comes to equality and social policy uh, and, and ensuring because there, there were concerns uh, that the UK frameworks uh, may fall behind uh, in some ways uh, within that area uh, and we wanted to ensure that uh, accessibility, uh, equality and transparency were very much part of, of that process. So it would be good to get a flavour as to 
are we meeting some of these expectations? Uh, or once again, are there still concerns about the, the mix match that still appears to be there? Uh, because as we, as we continue to progress, uh, we want to try and, and there have been areas where there have been concerns raised, but things have been ironed out or they've been progressed. So it would be good to get a flavour as to where you think we are and what opportunities there may be uh, going forward, because as we know, we're in a change situation with what might happen here in the United Kingdom with elections in a few weeks' time and then Europe having them already. Uh, and that may have an impact on what can and might, might and what will be done going in the future. Th thank you. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, one of the uh, most, well, one of the key aspects uh, of the work of the JAG was around regulatory cooperation and the level playing field. And it is very clear from the DAG report that we call on both parties to uphold their commitments uh, within the TCA, but also in line with ILO conventions and other uh, European uh, and international conventions when it comes to human rights uh, and equality. Um, and, and that is something that is shared across the board uh, from all membership of the DAG. Um, going forward, um, you know, uh, we're the UK and the EU are two uh, independent sovereign entities. They have the right to regulate, they have the right to legislate. Uh, and, and we as the DAG will be monitoring uh, legislation both in the UK and the EU to ensure that they remain committed to and uphold those, those commitments in the TCA. Um, as you said, there were a few issues, they have been ironed out. Um, and I think it is important that, as I said, that dialogue continues and that there are conversations and ongoing conversations between both parties. So I would say, um, you know, we're in a, a fairly good place at the moment. But the risk is, and it's the risk that is um, both implicit and explicit in a report. As I said, we're two separate entities. We can move forward. There's unintended consequences of legislation on both sides. And one of the roles of the DAG, and certainly the subgroup that we've set up on level playing field and regulatory cooperation, would be to monitor um, both UK and EU action uh, and regulatory activity to ensure that no side undermines the commitments uh, outlined in the TCA and our commitments to international standards. So that is very much a, a role, and I think that is important uh, to kind of underline the key role of a DAG is to ensure the funct full functioning and implementation of the TCA. And that is something we stand very strongly behind and defend uh, the elements of the TCA in those areas relating to human rights, equality and social policy. And the, the, the working groups and the committees that already have been set up in the past uh, have, have managed to balance uh, some of the issues uh, and, and negotiate uh, some others. Uh, but there is still a, a tension. Do you still think there is a tension uh, that, that is there? Uh, and that tension can create uh, winners and losers in all of this uh, about how we uh, should go forward. And, and if you had a, a little wish list of what you would like to see uh, coming forward or what you might want to influence in some way, uh, what would that be? Um, I, I wouldn't say tension is, is, is the word. I think, you know, as I said, from 2016 to the negotiations, these have been difficult times. And in order for any relationship to work to its full capacity, it's important that it is built upon trust. And I think that is the big um, important aspect of, of going forward is that both sides trust each other and that when there are issues that arise that both sides feel there is there are fora in which they can discuss negotiate find solutions and understand where people are coming from where both sides are coming from and i think this has been the challenge in the past where, where issues have become more political is because there hasn't been that regular dialogue, there hasn't been that conversation uh, and, and in the absence of that, that mistrust has, has set in and in fact when both sides have come around the table and talked about this one 
uh, I talked about issues, they realised that actually they're not that far from, from apart. So I think that is my big wish list going forward, is that we can put the last how many years, eight years behind. And for both sides, and I think it's important to stress both sides, to come to this, not with the shackles of the past, but actually look forward. Because we are in a very, very volatile world at the moment. Geopolitics, economic insecurities, climate change, the um, growth of China, what may happen in the US, India. There are a lot of things facing the UK and the EU. Working together, we can certainly move forward and, and actually address some of these societal challenges. And I think this is important, that we should be seen as good neighbours and not adversaries. Uh, and that requires a mind shift on both sides. And that is what I would really want to outline, is that as we move ahead, yes, there have been difficult times, but we can't afford to waste years uh, kind of uh, arguing, but actually working together to address the many, many societal and geopolitical challenges we, we're facing at the moment, cost of living crisis, uh, how you, you improve the competitiveness of the continent of Europe is, is, is of utmost importance. And the UK and the EU should be working hand in hand to ensure that we give uh, top priority to improving the competitiveness of the continent of Europe. And going back to Irene's opening remarks, this isn't just for business, this is for citizens, consumers, uh, and indeed, uh, you know, granting prosperity and moving people out of, out of poverty. So, you know, this is where we should be focusing on a win-win economics so that it can deliver for societal um, challenges as well. Thank you, and, and Mr. Fairbrook. Oh, further, the, the whole area of, of where we are when it comes to uh, society and citizens uh, about what their rights, uh, their obligations, uh, their wishes, their aspirations, uh, that's very much part of what is trying to be achieved. Uh, and and I, I recognise that. Uh, but it would be good to, to get your view once again on what the barriers, because barriers are still there. Uh, uh, there there's been an attempt... Uh, to embrace and uh, cooperate and uh, have some uh, collaboration on some things, and some have been successful and others have not. Uh, and it's sometimes been one side's opinion or one side's view as to what happens. But the citizen at the end of the day and the civil society that we're trying to create and trying to establish and, and move forward still has a role to play in this whole process. Uh, because at the end of the day, they want to see and be part of the future. Uh, because we, there is a future here, but it's just dependent on who's, what views and opinions you have of what side you sit on. Uh, uh, and, the, and the success of that will be down to the citizens uh, themselves as to how they manage that. Yeah, I mean, you know, really good points, uh, Mr Stewart, and also echo everything that Sean said. But, um, I mean, ju just to think, because your first point was around equalities and issues. Well, firstly, I think to say that um, we have a very good working relationship with the EU DAG. And so I think that offers great possibilities going forward. It takes time to set these things up. And we're all new at this. Well, the EU is not quite new because they've had domestic advisory groups in the past. But it's very new for the UK and the EU as a partnership to be sitting in DAGs across the table from each other. But I think we've now developed a very good working relationship with the EU DAG. But a couple of points I think maybe to mention, you know, one probably sits out with the TCA. And again, I think it's one that we could work with our EU colleagues on. And that's around, um, you know, the impact on disabled people, for example, disabled badges. Um, you know, pre-Brexit, there was a, a sort of voluntary cooperation, you might say, um, across all member states about acknowledging um, disabled badges and, and um, the fact that disabled people did not pay for parking um, and could have their disabled badge accepted. And that kind of broke down through Brexit. And it seems like a really kind of simple issue, but actually it's not yet quite fixed. Um, 
And but recently, the European Union, um, because they didn't even have one full agreement across all 27 member states that was um, more regulatory as opposed to voluntary, the European Union quite recently um, put in place a regulatory agreement around disabled parking. And one of the things that we've asked about is, you know, could that agreement somehow extend? Could we have some cooperation with our EU partners to acknowledge what previously had always been part of that scheme? And that was for EU disabled citizens, because this is really quite a big issue for disabled groups. So, I think it's one that can be sorted. I don't think it requires an amendment to the TCA. I think it requires that goodwill that Sean's talking about and as all to sort of recognise the issue um, and equally for us to ensure that disabled badges from Europe um, are, are able to be used in the UK, which they are. So, so there's something around that. The other thing um, which probably I think would require some amendments, and that's around the, the veterinary issues. And you probably know that at the minute, human um, assistance and service dogs fall within um, the part two listing as opposed to the part one listing, and therefore there are customs and import barriers around that. So, um, you know, for, for me, there's something around recognising that really, I think it's one of those unintended consequences that, that Sean spoke about, that really, um, you know, in terms of equalities, we shouldn't really have um, assistance dogs sitting within a restricted category and that that should really be opened up. So those are for me sort of two examples of, you know, how using that goodwill and cooperation and, and that those kind of more constructive discussions, which I feel like we're having now, um, you know, could help us to resolve citizens' issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karina. Thank you. I wonder if I could just... Um... Uh, ask a couple of more questions. The first one on, on, on the back of Mr Stewart's questions uh, around human rights and uh, appreciating everything that you've said, but um, we were in a position of the UK government talking about withdrawing from the, the um, United Nations and from the European Convention in order to um, implement the um, deportation of migrants to Rwanda. Um, were that to have gone ahead, would that have been a deal breaker, do you think, in terms of human rights cooperation with the EU? Well, I don't know, Sean, if you want to pick that one up. I think in terms of, you know, the sort of purdah that we're in just now, that's a difficult question. That's a difficult question. And I think it's more a matter of opinion. Um, and and uh, I don't know, Sean, if you'd want to say any more on that. I, I think I... I, I... Would agree with uh, Irene. It is it is difficult given um, various political parties' position on on this. Um, so I would uh, happy to answer that question post the fourth of July if that's if that is okay, convener. I'm sure we'll, we'll maybe take that opportunity to take that up with you. My other question was a uh, um, uh, in relation to um, something Irene mentioned earlier on about consumer rights. Um, uh, we have Child Safety Week this week in the UK. And um, we had a cross-party group last night where CAPT were presenting, and we also had trading standards officers with examples of some of the, the goods that are available online and in online marketplaces, which don't meet the standards um, uh, that we would expect in the UK and in, in Europe. And given that British standards remains part of that European organisation. Do you think there are opportunities there to um, maybe strengthen some of the consumer aspects of what's going forward uh, and in terms of regulation around issues like AI as well? Um, very much so. And I think this is one of the areas where we would want to focus on going forward. Um, and that's about mutual recognition, particularly of conformity assessment sharing of information and I know the UK has recently and the EU have recently uh, agreed on uh, RAP, uh, RAPEX which is the kind of information sharing and exchange um, so I think you know this is uh, an area where you know the UK and the EU have have very similar standards um, 
and indeed in most cases the UK standard is higher than the EU and I think this is often the perception and certainly I think one of the things I I have been trying to advocate um, to our EU counterparts, uh, despite the noise in, in media, etc., that the UK standards are, 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 are kind of top end gold standards when it comes to, to product safety, child safety, etc. Uh, and I think sometimes that's missed in the rhetoric that actually the UK does have a very high standards and in quite a few areas indeed and in, in kind of animal welfare, etc. They are, are much higher. I think this is an area which is safe ground and it's in the interest of both sides working collectively to ensure uh, safety of products. So very much a, a priority. But one of the areas that I think businesses are, are finding challenging is if you have to operate two systems. If you're a small business uh, and you have to apply a UK standard and an EU standard, it is just costly and indeed it is complex. Uh, and it would discourage particularly small, perhaps some small businesses from exporting to the EU. And that is a loss to the UK uh, economy. It, you know, exports can create jobs, and it's going back to this kind of citizen aspect. So, anything that can reduce the administrative burden and have consistency between the UK and the EU, have mutual recognition, have mutual uh, recognition agreements on conformity assessment, that it makes it easier for both sides to trade, will be uh, something that would be of great um, importance to us going forward. Very much underlining that the, the high standards must remain. This is not about a race to the bottom. This is about upholding high consumer rights, but just making it easier that, you know, if a product is deemed safe, so a UK standard, which is of a high standard, that it can be sold in the EU without unnecessary um, administration go forward. So very much support the continuation of high standards and consumer. But this is where perhaps both sides could get together to have much more agreements on a mutual basis. Thank you. I would just echo everything uh, Sean said there. I mean, the EU has that database system called Safety Gate. The UK has a system, you know, it makes sense for consumers, for them to talk to each other and for this to be to be resolved quickly in the interests of, of uh, citizens and consumers. That's great, thank you. I'm looking to see if there's any further questions from the committee this morning. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance once again, and, and no doubt we will be back in contact, uh, in contact <laughs> uh, after the election um, as we um, continue to pursue our inquiry on the TCA. So thank you very much. And we are now going to suspend for till quarter past 10 uh, for the next panel to on board. Thank you.
Thank you. A warm welcome back to committee. And uh, agenda item is to welcome the EU Domestic Advisory Group, Luisa Santos, Chair, Tanya Butzek, Vice Chair, and Leah Ofre. Vice Chair, and uh, welcome to you this morning. If I could open with, with, with a question. Um, in our inquiry, we have heard from various businesses and stakeholders based in the UK about the challenges trading with the EU post-Brexit. I'd be interested to hear EU business and civil society perspective on how the TCE has been operating from your side, whether you have seen any changes following the introduction of the border controls as uh, laid out in the Windsor Agreement and what your priorities are for developing the current scope of the TCA to better facilitate trade from the EU with the UK. And if I could maybe begin with Louisa, please. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, I hope you can hear me well because we had some issues with the microphone just before before we start. So good morning and thanks a lot for, for inviting us here. Um, since you, we will be speaking, um, the three of us, so we all represent three different groups. Maybe I'll start with, uh, with some initial remarks and then I will focus more on the business side, as you mentioned, and then my two colleagues will focus on their on their priorities. Um, I think uh, we all agree that uh, the UK remains a very important partner for the EU. It's just it's not just an economic partner, and uh, we we recall that uh, the UK is still the third uh, trading partner for the EU after, after the US and China. I think this sometimes needs to be recalled. People tend to forget. So it is important, uh, but it's also a partner from a political point of view uh, in view also of the current uh, geopolitical context. I think it is important that uh, the EU and UK are very well aligned on foreign policy and security issues. We know we have been cooperating on responding to Russia's aggression in Ukraine. We are also uh, aligning within the G7 on many different topics, uh, including on economic security, which I think is something that is very important for the EU as, as it is for the UK. So I think on all these issues of foreign policy, uh, security, defense, we are very aligned and we need to cooperate further. So I think this is definitely one area where I see uh, from all perspectives, including from the business perspective, the need for further cooperation uh, between the EU and UK. Then um, maybe I want to, to say as well, and this I think, I think is something shared by the EU DAG, is that we see uh, the elections on both sides, on the EU and UK, so on the EU this weekend, on the UK in July, as an opportunity uh, to, let's say, reboot the, the relationship. We also say in our Business Europe campaign, and now I'm talking Business Europe, uh, the need to reboot Europe. So maybe we need also to reboot a bit our relationship, um, recognizing that it has improved um, after a very tense uh, period of negotiations. I think especially the Windsor framework has improved uh, the general environment uh, and it has brought a more positive spin. We have seen results already. Uh, the fact that the UK is now part of Horizon Europe, this is very important for uh, the scientific community, for the business community and, and overall also for our uh, research and innovation efforts uh, jointly. So I think that that is a very important step. Uh, more recently, we also seen, and, and this is something that the consumers on the European side, but also on the UK side, are very happy with. We've seen cooperation in RAPES, so in the uh, detection of products that could be uh, of concern for the safety of consumers. So also here, we are now again cooperating, so this is important. So we see some positive developments, but of course we see still some challenges and I will mention them. 
One clear challenge relates to the facilitation of trade between the EU and UK. Uh, we have introduced, of course, uh, border controls, and some of them are still in the process of being introduced. I mean, uh, the BTOM is clearly uh, the new border target operation model is clearly one. I mean, we will have to see uh, with time and with more and more controls because we are it will be a staged process how this will in, impact overall uh, the trade between the EU and UK. Um, then there is, of course, very much the connection with Northern Ireland. Uh, we are, of course, very happy with the Windsor framework. For us, it's very important that we respect uh, the Good Friday Agreement uh, and peace and stability in Northern Ireland. This is very important. It's very important for all of us, either business uh, consumers or in general uh, trade unions and citizens. So this is very important. Uh, and we are particularly looking at the impact uh, of the facilitation of trade uh, in goods in Northern Ireland as very important. The second aspect uh, I would say relates, of course, to regulations in general. Uh, and, and this has to do not only with a level playing field, but also with adding new barriers or potential new barriers to, to trade if legislation starts to diverge a lot. Uh, I think uh, we, we have seen a lot of new initiatives on the European side in the area of Green Deal, in the area of the digital single market. And of course, the more we legislate also on the UK side, uh, the more the potential for divergence is. So I think this is one of the key areas where we will need to look and work more. Uh, I mean, we do have working groups dedicated to regulatory cooperation and I think these working groups need to be fully working and we probably need in the future to see other areas where uh, where this work needs to be to be implemented uh, and put forward. Uh, I would just mention of course in the area of climate and energy uh, we have uh, right now we are in the middle of the discussions whether the UK will introduce his own, his own carbon, border, uh, carbon border adjustment measure. So it's on CBAM uh, because the EU has one. And definitely, I mean, if we can align our policies in this area of carbon leakage, uh, how to address carbon leakage, and we can align our two systems, that would be, would be good. Then the whole level playing field, I think, is very important. I'm sure uh, Tanya will, will touch more on that one. But of course, it's very important then in the area of environment, but also social rights, uh, we kept the same level because otherwise uh, there is a risk of a negative impact in the TCA. And it's important as well to ensure that we respect these commitments. I would like to add with, to end with one point and that's all related to services because this is very important. It touches, it impacts also goods it impacts also people. Uh, we do know that uh, the, the, how sensitive these days are migration, the movement of people, but of course this impacts the fact that we are less able to uh, go between the EU and UK and to provide services in particular on both markets is creating issues, additional issues. We need still to work a lot on the recognition of professional qualifications. I think this is an area where work needs to be done on both sides. Uh, the other area, of course, we have issues now with some of the initiatives on the UK on sponsorship programs for our professional uh, services to be, to be provided in UK. We know there's also concerns about uh, the culture and, and art services. So I think here there's work to be done going forward. The other area is on data because of course we have uh, a data adequacy decision that the EU is unilaterally granting to the UK. But of course it's very important that the UK stays aligned with the EU also in terms of data privacy. Otherwise we will have eventually in the future uh, uh, the withdrawal of data 
adequacy. So we ideally we should try to have a more stable solution also within the agreement, similar to what we did with, with Japan, for instance, to allow that we have really a permanent solution or ideally a permanent solution in this area. So final points, and I want to take no, too much of your time. Uh, it is important, of course, to restate that the UDAG, uh, we have been cooperating with the UK DAG, and, and this is very important that civil society cooperates, uh, that we exchange on areas that we think we have uh, common interests, but also point out to the areas where we see problems. I think this is very important. We would like to have more cooperation with the parliamentary assembly here. I think that's very important as well, because that's the other important body that is monitoring uh, the overall trade agreement. So I will end here and give the floor then to, to my colleagues that I'm sure will we'll go a bit deeper in some of these aspects. And thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Louisa. Could I invite Tanya next? Thanks. Well, thank you very much. I hope I am audible. Apologies for the rather poor setting, but I'm right here in the middle of a council meeting in Brussels. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity of the engagement. I can seamlessly follow what Louisa had said in particular. Um, I would say on the one hand also that we see a positive development of the relationship between the EU and the UK. And that is something what we jointly as the EU and the UK domestic advisory group had always been advocating for. It is a unique relationship. It always will be one. We want to contribute it also to further improving. But of course, then, as Louis had also said, we are on the verge of elections. As a matter of fact, the UK election was actually scheduled for the civil society forum that was um, happened in, was supposed to happen in, in July here in Brussels. So we've now postponed everything to September, which will give us an opportunity as the two DACs to come also together with a new setting after the UK election, after the European parliamentary elections, to also see how we can further strengthen that relationship. Um, that was on the one part. Also between us as the two domestic advisory groups, and thank you also very much, Louise, that you highlighted this cooperation aspect. Of course, we uh, we are, have a slight different setup. We started our work also differently when it was about what are our priorities. Um, the UK DAG has produced their report. We have produced our issues tracker. There are a lot of overlaps that we now in the coming months also jointly in the preparation for the September meeting will now see to explore where we can come up also together with solutions. Coming more to the points, um, I will come here from, from my side as a representative of the workers' group. And Louisa already touched up on, for us, one of the most core points that we actually also share with the other um, uh, groups within the EU domestic advisory group is, of course, on the level playing field and the regulatory cooperation. In particular, um, we still have, let's say, a lot of concerns that we have raised, in particular with the Commission, with a number of UK um, legislative acts, in particular with the Minimum Service Level Act, um, and the impact that it will have um, the, um, on the core commitments that are taken on the protection of labour rights uh, within the TCA. Of course, there were a couple of other announcements, when, for instance, when it comes to, um, you know, with, uh, with strikes and with agency workers and replacements. So far, with many of those announcements, we can only warn and monitor what the possible impact could be, but that would be particular also on the side um, of the workers group. Maybe also to highlight, and I'm sure this is also the case with my other colleagues also from the business side, but I think it is in particular very strongly on the workers group side, that of course we act together with our trade union counterparts on the UK DAX side. For the pure fact, the TUC and also the trade union, the sectoral trade unions, we are still part of a European trade union family. The TUC is still part of the European Trade Union Confederation. So we share the joint concern that collectively we also bring um, together. I think in particular for the level playing field beyond the case of the workers group and the trade unions, I think it is important to uphold and build on the level playing field commitments. And that was also the conversation that we had in our informal DAC to DAC meeting that was Mendel's preparation for September. We raised the point how important it is that precisely we uphold those commitments and actually also to ensure that there is no um, no infringement on what side, because in that fact, it also has an impact on competitiveness and on competition policy. So for us, there is a strong, um, a strong nexus um, between the two. Louisa had also, thank you very much, mentioned also the situation in Northern Ireland. Of course, there we are. Um, 
strongly align with our colleagues on the UK tax side. It must not lead to any diminution of rights on the Northern Ireland side, in particular also with link to the Windsor framework. Um, it also then comes to linkage uh, with the human rights um, angle of Article 2. So I think that is also well, very well um, um, set down in the UK's DAC report, to which uh, we also fully subscribe on that element, in particular in Northern Ireland. So I think on my side, that would be the two highlights or the two elements that I would raise in particular. But also with the regular cooperation, I think it is then also important because, and I think Leah might touch upon that, even though we have a strong commitment to work on the regulatory question, but so far it feels a bit like that we have not made yet that progress and not exploited that potential that we could do. So you see, I think from one seamlessly from Luisa to myself and followed up by Leah, we are very much in line on, on many of the um, many of the core topics. And of course, when it comes to to visas and the mobility, I think not only for the service sector, this is this is an important topic that we've touched upon, but also for us, it's like it needs also be uh, the conditionality to link also to to uphold and to respect of, of labor and employment's right in that in that it's not should be just like you know a fast track or or short or short visa um, exchange on that. So I think there are a lot of elements that are linked from the overall topics, always back revert back to uphold protect. Um, uh, labor rights commitments that are under the TCA. So I think I can can close for a first intervention there. And of course, I'm happy to uh, come back. Good. Okay, I think we just losing you at the end there, Tanya, I'm afraid. I don't know if you can hear us. Um, uh, it was just the last few seconds of what you're saying. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll try and move on uh, to Leah, and then hopefully we'll be able to um, get back to you in any questions. So Leah. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you again for this invitation. I mean, it, it's really important for us as DAC members to be able to, to have this conversation with you. And also just to echo what my colleagues uh, ju just said on the importance of their relationship and the improvement of their relationship. Maybe to give you also a bit of an um, insight of uh, what we are doing in the EU domestic advisory group, and especially my group, which is then a group three, because it's a bit of a different group compared to Luisa's group, who's focusing on, on businesses in the European side. Tanya was more focusing on uh, trade unions. Uh, my group is more a gathering of completely diverse uh, interests, so from European universities to groups that are protecting oceans, groups uh, focusing on animal welfare, environment protection, and many others, and, and my own organization, which is looking at consumer protection. So we are more looking at the public uh, interests uh, aspect of the relationships of not specifically trade in, in goods and services in the commercial sense of it. But one thing that I would echo from what my colleague just said is that for my group, it's really, really important that we keep on having the promotion for higher uh, level of protection when it comes to uh, the environment, to uh, consumer protection, animal welfare, keeping on the cooperation between universities also. So we had very positive developments. And maybe to keep it short also to uh, echo what just Tanya, Tanya just said, huh? There is a, a dif difference between what we're hearing at the highest political level on the cooperation and the development, the progress happening. So we had this uh, recent statement um, uh, regarding the development of the cooperation, including the one that we just mentioned on market surveillance. So this possibility to have cooperation and to exchange data. So the highest political level has said, we have the green light. Now both sides should be able to cooperate. What I'm hearing on the field is not the same. Huh? Um, there is a, really a difference, and I'm not sure this will be materialized anytime soon, so not even this year. So here, I think it would be important also for, for parliamentarians to, to be involved there and better understand what is the, the problem and how we can actually unlock this cooperation, because sometimes it's really a technical level, and so it's important to, to look a bit beyond the, the surface and see what more we could all do. And also on our side, to try to, to stimulate a bit this cooperation and help authorities to connect again in a very positive um, manner. And that's something, I mean, on top of market civilians cooperation, it's also about how we're going to continue to cooperate together and work together when it comes to uh, climate, environmental protection. 
how can we look into uh, learning also on our side and in Europe from what the UK is doing on animal welfare protection? Because there are a lot of progress that the EU could get inspiration from. We could maybe look at creating a veterinary area, looking at cooperating more on food safety uh, aspect, also with a relation with the big dog. So there are many things that we can continue to, to work on. And maybe just to flag that sometimes um, we are a bit limited in our scope into what we can do as domestic advisory group because our focus is really on the trade and cooperation agreement. So there are many cooperation uh, areas that are not yet foreseen uh, in the agreement and that we would need to see and also because it's the natural development of the new relationship. Uh, so that is something also that could be interesting to explore from the parliament perspective on how we could expand a bit that scope. There is the review process that will come up soon uh, for this trade and cooperation agreement. So maybe we can explore here how we can be a bit more flexible uh, in terms of how we can further develop the, the new relationship. And I will keep it uh, at here for the moment, but I would be happy to answer any further questions that you have. No, that, that's super. Thank you all for all those opening statements. I'm going to move to questions from the committee. Uh, and uh, uh, Alexandra Stewart, first, please. Thank you, uh, thank you convener, and good morning. <clears throat> in, our, in our last session, we were discussing uh, some of the mutual recognition systems uh, that are apparent. And there was some discussion from Irene uh, in the last session about where we were when it came to disabled individuals. Uh, and disabled people's parking rights. Uh, th there seems to obviously be a, a, a logjam when, when that, and I know there's an attempt uh, to have sort of mutual, mutual recognition systems when that comes together, uh, but it would be good to get a flavour from you if you see that as something that can be achieved uh, in, in the medium to, uh, to, to, to short term, uh, or, or are there more problems along those lines uh, of uh, disabled individuals and citizens having difficulties uh, ensuring when they, when they go from one to the other. And maybe if I go to... <laughs> Louisa, yes, if we go to Louisa first. Thank you, Louisa. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, I mean, I think the when it comes to mutual recognition in general, we need to, if it is in our in our side as as european dark the priority has been in the professionals where we know there's a lot of exchange between eu and uk we're talking about the accountings the lawyers the architects so those have been the priorities um we know that uh, the one that is more developed because of course the framework is there and then it's up to the professions to come up with the proposals uh, we know that the ones that have been discussing these uh, and are more advanced are the architects. Uh, but uh, so far, the proposals that have been made are not exactly well balanced. So there is still not an agreement uh, on, on, this, on this particular one. The other ones uh, we see, at least for the moment, less of an interest from the professional associations or at least less proactiveness to come up with uh, with some solutions. But indeed, this, this is very much, of course, an issue that requires first a proposal from uh, the private sector, and then that, of course, what is proposed is accepted by the two governments. Uh, but, but so far, uh, this is what I can tell you. So it's definitely an area where more work needs to be done starting with uh, the civil society, or in this case, the, the, the private actors and, and the service providers and the professionals before uh, something is proposed to the, to the two governments. Thank you. I, I also talked about uh, the transparency uh, and the frustrations that still uh, seem to be apparent uh, going forward and, and the, the knowledge uh, that we want to try and iron out as many of the difficulties as we can, uh, but there still seems to be uh, areas where uh, there, there's a conflict. Uh, and and we, we know, as you've identified, elections are coming uh, in the not-too-distant future uh, with yourself and with ourselves here, and that may 
give a change of direction in some way, do you think that that would be able to then diminish some of that frustration and, and progress things? Or do you think we'll still be in the same locations? Well, I hope things will progress. That's the only thing that I think we all, we all can expect. Uh, it is still very politically charged. I mean, we, we should not fool ourselves. The relation remains politically charged. Uh, I think the, the urgencies are now also leading us to cooperate more. Um, and I think those urgencies, in particular, the threats or potential threats that we are uh, confronted, uh, both the EU and UK, and we are on the same side, I think these are much more important and potentially will, uh, will you know, create an environment that, that is politically more positive uh, for further cooperation. I think... Um, on the economic side, it will still be or on the pure economic side and maybe on issues that have to do with legislation and the way we legislate in, pre, in key areas might still be uh, subject to tensions. I'm not saying it won't be um, because, of course, we know that the UK, when it left the EU, ideally, the one of the most critical factors was indeed the, the regulations and the fact that the UK wanted to define his own objectives and his own rules. So I think here uh, we will continue to have uh, some frictions. It doesn't mean that um, we will not be able to cooperate. If we have the same objectives, uh, it's not necessarily because we, we have different ways of achieving them that uh, we will be uh, further apart. But the way also the UK legislates in some of these areas it will be fundamental for the future because we, especially in things that have to do, you know, with sustainability broadly, uh, but also or also very specific rules when it comes to sectors that are highly regulated, you know, uh, machinery, chemicals, etc., pharmaceuticals. So. We have seen here uh, more or less not a huge divergence, but if in the future there is, then of course uh, the, the frictions will, will increase. I repeat, I think, uh, and this is my conviction, I think that general geopolitical context will uh, force the governments to cooperate more, maybe on issues more related to defense and security at an initial stage, but I expect that with a new government on the two sides, there will definitely be a, a new way of, of approaching things. And then it will be very much concretely how and when we can develop this new, new, new approach. And the, the, the Windsor framework was welcomed uh, and embraced by both sides as to where things can go. Uh, how do you see the future of uh, that developing, if, if there is a, a mark two for the Windsor framework or uh, more progress that's required on certain areas, whether it be on citizenship, whether it be on trade, whether it be on mobility, uh, these, these are all still live uh, situations and circumstances. Uh, and and the, the hope, uh, I think, is that, that there would be some more negotiations and some more uh, discussion about what might be achieved for the future. Look, I think uh, on on that we, we we're all we are all look the, the Northern Ireland issue is 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 an issue recognised by by everyone. I think we want to have a stable environment there. Um, so the winds we are all very much looking at how the winds framework is is implemented and whether it works or not. Uh, and I think so far, uh, I mean, we have not, because there was a lot of skepticism uh, from, from a lot of sides on whether it would be working or not. I think there is very, even in the current situation we, from the two governments, there's always been um, an attitude that has been very careful how to deal with uh, the implementation of the Windsor framework. I think going forward, and this is something that uh, comes actually on clearly on the statement that the last joint statement that we did as EU UK DAG, we did point to the need to have a very good uh, monitoring of the situation and an excellent dialogue, a very close dialogue with the business community, but also with the civil society on the ground. 
because that's important to ensure that you know some of the concerns are dissipated and that uh, we actually go to a more uh, normal relationship uh, and and that you know even concerns that were raised by particularly in Northern Ireland both by business and civil society are not materializing on the ground and that will remain important for all of us and for all our groups uh, so I think this is work in progress it's not it's not over yet and and it will continue to be one of the key aspects um, in the relationship going forward. But I think we are in a different basis and a more positive basis. You know, there's others want to come in and time is moving on, so I'm happy to. Um, yeah, I, I just to open it up to, to uh, Tanya or Leah, if you want to respond to Mr. Alexander. We are conscious of time though, so, um, but do either of you want to come in? Yep, um, I can't see the name from here. I think it's Leah that wants to come in. Thank you. No, I think at this stage I, I, I don't have anything specific to add. Maybe if Tanya wants to add something? Yes, my apologies. I think this uh, muting and unmuting is not uh, as smoothly and also apologies to uh, to the chair and the convener. It, I seem to have a rather unstable internet connection. Apologies that I broke off earlier. Maybe just like um, to add, I think, Alexander, you made, it's like you, you made a very good point in particular on, we will realize over the time that there will be standards no longer matching, but it will have an impact on the real life of people. And I think there we have to also find precisely the solution. You touched up in a particular on the hinderings on an obstacle for mobility between um, the UK and uh, the EU countries to actually to move around. But to give you another side uh, example also from our side, the EU has moved on on a lot of legislation now when, for instance, when it comes to due diligence, platform work, um, there is a lot of protection also for workers' rights in there, but there is nothing equivalent on the UK side so far. So I think this is also something that we need to very strongly look to, to actually then also to achieve the overarching goal that we want to uphold the level playing field um, commitments. So I think this, this partly touches upon the point that you said, of course, over the time we do move on. But I think on this part, I think it is important also for us, the core, the anchor in the agreement are the level playing field commitments for them to uphold and actually to protect also the um, the rights that are uh, leveled on that. So I would close it here and happy to come on to the next one. Thank you. Um, Neil? Yeah. You know, good morning to the panel. I just wanted to ask a, a general question. We talked about, obviously, this morning about the importance of the relationship and uh, the improvement in the relationship. And obviously, this, uh, the Secretariat of the group is the UK government. And I just wanted to see how you thought um, the setup performs in terms of the relationships with all four nations. We're obviously here in the Scottish Parliament scrutinising it from a Scottish perspective, but also, you know, Wales, Northern Ireland um, and England uh, make up the rest of the United Kingdom. So I just wondered from each of your perspectives how you felt the, um, the current arrangement was uh, taking into account issues from um, each of the devolved nations in the UK. Um, Leah, do you want to come in first? Or, or sorry, Tanya, do you want to come in first? And then uh, I'll come to that. Apologies to Leah for jumping to you, but in particular that, um, because like uh, we were very closely also um, involved in the setting up of the domestic advisor groups. And of course, you are very much, you have a unique situation with the nations and regions on the UK side. I understand also that sort of the government had reopened uh, the call for members of the domestic advisory groups to actually to pro more properly reflect that. One has also to say, of course, one key argument always on argument, a uh, key principle on the DAG sites that we have on the on the EU, we have now uh, 12 domestic advisory groups, which of course is always a balanced representation. I see this was not in the final text of the TCA, unfortunately, but I think this is this is the part of the having a, a good balanced representation of the region, nation that we have, but also balanced representation um, of the group. You touched up on of something that, um, because when I said, like, I'm just connecting now here from the council, I just reported to Trade Policy Council here about the domestic advisory groups. And there was also the question about, you know, the support and the facilities that we do get. Having an independent secretariat, I think, is, is of utmost importance. On the EU side, we have the added 
uh, advantage of having the European Economic and Social Committee, the ESC, providing the secretariat for all the domestic advisory groups. The emphasis, the ESC is not government, it's civil society. They are not instructed by the Commission nor any member state as a secretariat. It's a completely independent source, human resource secretariat that um, um, improves our work quality tremendously. And I think I just, I just wanted to make that, that linkage, of course, that, of course, importance to have the composition of the DAG with the members, with the UK region uh, and, uh, and nations, but also with the various groups, but also for the DAGs to be supported in their, uh, in their day to day work. And by the way, it comes not also down to very um, practical reasons like the funding. The EU domestic advisory groups do receive some limited funding for members to actually also to travel, even to come to Brussels. I understand also it's the same uh, challenge that you're facing because not all members, if the meeting are happening in London or meetings are happening in Edinburgh, not everyone is always at the same time. Even we can use remote settings. It is also important to have, let's say, the financial support for an operational functioning of the DAC, not to mention for doing the joint meetings, even though I'm taking the Eurostar on a regular basis. It's not a long journey, not like when we are traveling to Korea in September, but it also needs some substantial support for members to travel because what it must not come to down to that only the member organizations that can afford to be a member of the domestic advisory group should also be a member of the group. It should be for the competence of the group and then to get the additional funding and the support also from um, from the institution, from the government side. I just wanted to make that plea, not only from our experience, but it took also a lot of space in our dark to dark collaboration. So um, apologies for taking that side. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to do it? I don't, I don't know if anyone else has any further thoughts on that from uh, Louisa or Leah from their perspectives. Uh, Leah? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I mean, I would also um, echo what Tanya just said on the importance to have an independent uh, secretariat, because it's important, I mean, for us also to, to receive uh, some uh, input from the European Commission to hear what they would like us to do. But then we remain completely free to design our work as we want and also in the tone that we want to adopt, especially for the, the joint statement that we can have for the, the domestic advisory group, which is a very important also political signal for the leaders to also drive the more progressive and more positive relationship. So I would really insist on this aspect. And it's true that on the European side, it raises some questions from the civil society perspective um, to have a bit of a less independent secretariat on the UK DAG uh, uh, side, of course. Um, and something also that was a bit surprising from a personal perspective was also the composition of uh, the UK DAG and the selection of the, the members, notably uh, looking especially in the consumer movement in the UK. So there, there was this possibility for some group to attend, but only because they were working on specific issues, so namely energy. But for other groups that had a more horizontal approach, uh, it was very surprising for me, at least, not to see them as member of the UK DAG because uh, we are talking on uh, cooperation on market surveillance, for instance, they are absent from that discussion and they have a great relationship with the market surveillance authority, also in terms of nations and region. Uh, Northern Ireland uh, groups are not necessarily represented, which is uh, a bit surprising, at least from our side on the consumer movement, for instance. And another point that I want to bring to your attention is that, so we have the domestic advisory group, and we're here to look at the implementation of the trade and cooperation agreement. But there is also, as a part of the trade and cooperation agreement, the civil society forum that Tanya mentioned that happens once a year. For me, this is something very important because it's a moment where uh, civil society organization, be it from the private, the trade unions or NGOs, can better understand what is being discussed in the context of this EU-UK framework on trade and cooperation. The problem that we've been seeing is that there is kind of a barrier of entry uh, to attend this discussion, uh, including from the UK side. And so I was a bit surprised, for instance, last year, because for the Civil Society Forum, there were the members of the UK Domestic Advisory Group who could participate and um, speak during the Civil Society Forum, which is different from the DAG. 
And then there was a part for observers. And these people were not able to ask a question or make a point. And then it's a bit of a pity, I would say, because then uh, it reduces the scope of the discussion that we can have and this ability for groups that are not involved in the day-to-day -day work on the trade and cooperation agreement to have a say and also raise important questions to help us uh, further advance in the relationship. Uh, so that might be something um, to explore a bit deeper in the future. Um, thank you. Louisa, did you want to come in? Yes, thank you. No, just to, to, to point out two to additional aspects. Uh, first, that this is a, a different domestic advisory group on the EU side that we normally have on other trade agreements, because this, uh, this domestic advisory group with the UK covers the whole of the agreement. Uh, and this explains, uh, while in the others normally is only the sustainability chapter uh, that we have in our free trade agreement. So, so this is a bit different, which also means that we had a huge interest at the beginning from the part of the business organizations to join the domestic advisory group on the EU side. So we had over 70, I think 74 or 77 business organizations, and there was not really a selection. So we had even situations where we have regional organizations in European countries. I mean, it's not the same as, as the UK, but we had this situation. So we had to reorganize, to organize ourselves to allow to have the balanced relation, the balanced representation that we have now with 10, 10 and 10. But beyond the 10 that represent the business, you have additional 64 or 65 that are under different uh, subgroups to make sure that we were not, you know, that the business group was not overwhelmingly represented uh, then in the, in the DAC. So, so just to, to let you know that this was a very special uh, exercise from the European side and uh, particularly from the business community because we had to find a way of reorganizing ourselves and we are still trying to make sure that this all works and that in the process we do not have some people frustrated because they are not uh, able, all of them, to be there constantly uh, and there is a, a difference between the DAG, the members, the effective members and the ones that are than in these in these in these groups, but apart from that, I mean, I agree in particular what what Tanya said. Of course, we have a very specific structure on the EU side, uh, the ESC, the European Economic and Social Committee, that allows already this very balanced representation of the three groups, uh, and this is a good platform to host the DAX. Uh, so, it is indeed the fact that we have less of uh, an interference of the government in the work that we do. Um, it doesn't mean that they are not present or that we don't have exchanges with, with them, with the commission, but we do develop our work uh, in a very independent way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, Kavina. Um, I would just like to um, finish with a question. Um, I think, uh, Louisa, you mentioned the PPA. Um, uh, um, my, myself and my deputy convener set as observers on the PPA from Scotland, although, although we are allowed to take part in the breakout sessions and to um, occasionally speak at the plenary sessions as well. Um, so I was wondering, um, who's leading? Are you? What's the what's the relationship with the PPA? So obviously they've come out with some priorities, um, including youth mobility, which we saw some movement from the Commission. But how how do you um, interact with the PPA? And we, you were talking about a reset of of Brussels and a, a reboot of relationships, which I think um, you know most of us see see that as an opportunity um, later uh, this year. However. Um, you mentioned the, the big geopolitical issues in terms of um, the economy, in terms of um, the, the war in Ukraine as well. As the, the incoming members um, of the European Union who will, who will be sitting on the PPA going forward, many of them will not have worked with UK MEPs. Those relationships are, 
um, diluted over time. So how, how, how do you see it as the best way forward in actually um, strengthening and building on those relationships um, uh, come the, the autumn? If I could start with Louisa, please, for that. Thanks. Thanks a lot. That's a very good question. I mean, when I mentioned the PPA, it's because we feel that uh, there has not been a, enough of an exchange between the PPA and, and the DAC and the Domestic Advisory Group. Uh, we believe it is important precisely because these are the two most important bodies, independent bodies, uh, also monitoring the agreement and the implementation of the agreement, that there is more of a cooperation uh, and that we are able to sit, for instance, in the meetings or at least come and present also what the DAG is doing uh, to the PPA. So this for us is important. And, and I, we think that talking about the reboots of the relationship or uh, trying to, to reset it, uh, this definitely is, is an area where we think we need more cooperation between these two bodies, more structured dialogue, um, more exchanges because a lot of the things are, uh, of course, in we have common objectives. Uh, so it, it would be important also to strengthen uh, our voice vis-a-vis -vis the two governments that uh, we try to, to come up together and more coordinated. So that's one, one aspect. Then the other, th the second aspect is, of course, how the, the European Parliament will look like and also how the UK Parliament will look like after, after the election. So, so definitely, I mean, this is uh, this is right now the the big debate here in in Brussels is what will the the elections mean in terms of the European Parliament. Uh, we believe, and of course now I'm uh, I'm a bit uh, doing a kind of a, uh, pre pre, pre uh, let's say um, with a with a crystal ball trying to 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 foresee the future. But uh, we expect, in any case, of course, we will have uh, an increase in the in the in the rights, um, and some in some cases the the extreme right. That's very clear. Um, we still believe that the center should hold the majority, but of course, um, a lot uh, will depend, and I think uh, many many of the commentators are not sure, and neither are we, how many people will go and vote. I mean, we have done a big campaign also as European business, both at European level, national level, to ask everyone to go and vote. We have a lot of young voters as well, because in, in many countries now, as of 16, you'll be able to vote. So nobody knows exactly if they will vote, and now they will vote. Uh, so I think this is going to determine a lot as well how uh, the, the parliament will be will be uh, in the future, and which political groups will be uh, will be relevant. But I still believe we will have a relatively stable group that will want to improve the relations with with UK. So um, and possibly even more uh, interested in developing a better relation. I think, and I'll finish here. I think one of the messages that is coming out more clearly now at the end of the, this uh, legislation. This, it's an importance of putting competitiveness back as a key priority for the EU. Again, we are not discussing, we are not putting question the Green Deal or, or the digital and green transformation, but we need to make sure we have the means to do this smoothly and, and therefore we need to have a sufficient economic growth and strong and competitive companies. So I think this is going to be very much uh, a motto uh, as well for the future. And this gives, in my view, uh, positive opportunities to have a more uh, a more forthcoming agenda with the UK in view of the review of the TCA. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I wondered if Tanya or Leah wanted to uh, come in on that too. Um, yep, Tanya. Uh, yes, now it's working. Um, well, thank you very much, Claire, for the question, also for Luis uh, for raising this in the very uh, beginning. I have to say, I share your frustration when you said, um, yeah, you can come to the PPA, you can be speaking in the, in the breakout sessions. I share the frustration because it was the same for me. 
I had the opportunity to speak up as when I was uh, in the first minute, the chair of the DAG uh, in, the, in the breakout session, but of course not beyond that. But I also have to highlight the pure fact that I was invited there was not because I was the chair. I was invited as an ESC member. And in fact, it was the president of the ESC who was invited. And I said, if he goes, I go along with him because I am the chair of the DAG. That is something because Luis is now the new chair. If the same arrangement will continue like that, it would not work because Luis is not an ESC member. So I think we, we've highlighted this for a long time to say, if I speak now, I speak in my capacity as the chair. But it's like I got the invitation through a different road. And there is sometimes also, I have to say, and maybe just like I forgot that in the beginning, maybe a bit mixed up sometimes between the DAG and the ESC. I just want to clarify now also, the members of the domestic advisory group, they are not drawn from the ESC. They are including the ESC, because I happen to be an ESC member, a member of this DAG, but we have, as Luisa had already explained, we have so many other organizations that are non-ESC members. So it's like it is a, it's a mixed body of civil society organizations that apply with the commission to become a member, Plus, there is a number of seats that are allocated to the ESC, and we become also a member together with our fellow DAG um, colleagues. Um, the mix-up is also, unfortunately, and I think this is partly then with, um, uh, with uh, the nations and the regions, um, the committee of the regions and the role of the ESC in the, in the PPA, which is not with the institutional role that, for instance, that the DAG do have. So I think it's we have, we have created a lot of very useful and important bodies, but we need to sort of to distinguish on the various hats and roles that we that we wear. And I think what Louisa had said, of course, the new incoming members, and I hope they will have a lot of affinity for the UK, otherwise not to be nominated, they have a lot of experience. Let's hope for that. We will definitely work also as a DAG presidency and with our members together to reach out to our DAG, uh, to our PPA members in the new parliament. But I think it would be also a good opportunity to strengthen, if we cannot do it officially, the ties between the PPA members and the DAG maybe also on the UK side. So um, your colleagues that are attending the PPA uh, meetings as an observer or whatever capacity, reach out to the UK DAG beforehand. Go with all the knowledge what they give you as an opportunity. You will be very well prepared members of that meeting. So maybe let's do it the other way around, but we will keep pushing also in our joint statements for an official role for the DAC chair in the PPA and also in the regular exchange um, between the PPA uh, um, uh, co-chair and uh, also with the EU domestic advisory group. Thank you. It's very helpful. Thank you, Tanya. And uh, I'm going to give a final thought to Leah on this if you want to come in. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. And just to support what Luisa and Tanya just said also and, and bring that dimension of the added value of talking to the UK DAG, the EU DAG, because I mean, it's, I think, very important for the PPA to have a reality check of how the relationship is going on the ground. And for me, what I really appreciate when I have we have those meetings at, on the EU DAG or where we talk to our UK counterpart is to better understand what is working in the relationship, what is not working and identify areas of progress. And this for the PPA will be complicated with not, without having this discussion. So we, it would be very important to have a more natural relationship and automatic uh, relationship, which is at the moment indeed not really happening and, and creates also some frustration from civil society of not having this feeling of being uh, involved and listened to. Uh, so indeed, as a colleague just said, it would be interesting to explore that and, and develop that a bit further. Thank you very much. I think that exhausts our questions this morning. Can I just say thank you to you all for your attendance this morning? Um, I think we're all sort of waiting with bated breath to see what both sets of elections bring going forward. But certainly um, uh, we do engage very strongly in this committee with the, the UK DAG. And I'm sure, um, given what you've said today, that we'll be opening that up to working further with yourselves going forward um, uh, uh, in a role in the Parliament here. So thank you very much. And on that note, I'm going to close this session of the Parliament. Thank you.